the recipient of the 2013 Truman Reagan Medal of Freedom. Dr. Yang has been a tireless advocate of freedom and democracy. As founder of the Foundation for China the 21st Century and President of Initiatives for China. And he's an inspiration to all who love liberty and are committed to the freedom and independence of all peoples. So please, Dr. Yang. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Good afternoon. <coughs> Hear me well? Okay, okay. And um, first thing I want to say is uh, communism is uh, not legacy in China. It is everyday reality. And uh, you know, people at this foundation, of course, believe in free market capitalism. capitalism. And uh, many people in this country mistake Chinese economy for a free market. So I'm telling you, there's no such a thing as free market in China. And I will tell you what it is and uh, how it came into being, briefly. So the, the communist rule can be roughly divided into three periods. First one, from 1949, when communists took power in China, to uh, late 70s, when Deng Xiaoping began the reform. Then the second period, the beginning of the reform to Tiananmen Square Massacre. And the third <coughs> would be the Tiananmen Massacre <coughs> till this day. Uh, in the first 30 years of the CCP's rule in China, I, I said in my speech today, uh, it conducted the cruelest theft of private property and built a totalitarian central planning system which resulted in 30 six million death of starvation during the Great Leap Forward, including three of my direct family members. And the CCP constantly generated the political, bloody political turmoil, including Cultural Revolution, everybody know that. And that resulted in another 30 million deaths. And it created most numerous cases of injustice. If you go to China, you ask anybody on the street whether his or her family was affected during these years, very li likely you will only hear yes, nothing else. And of course, we know uh, uh, during these years, the communist uh, perpetrated barbarous destruction of uh, China's historical heritage, traditional culture, morality, <coughs> and religious beliefs, and also natural environment. And tens of uh, millions of families were thrown into disaster, unspeakable suffering, and the entire country brought to the brink of collapse when Mao Zedong died. And not long after Deng, uh, Mao Zedong died, Deng Xiaoping took power and began the reform, seeking to re reverse the previous course that entered the second period I just mentioned. And people soon found that CCP was conducting the other of the two diametrically opposed pieces of a devil's business. Remember at first, in the name of the revolution, they grabbed a pro private property to build a, a planned economy, a publicly owned economy. And in the name of reform, now they began another uh, a piece of a devil's uh, business, you know, they, they still, in the name of, of reform, they stole public property and put it into the private pockets of party officials and their associates. So that actually spawned the 1989 student movement. 
the, the nationwide demonstration, protest against the government corruption, corruption, uh, corruption and demanding for freedom and democracy. So that's the second period. And that demonstration, the movement ended in bloodshed of Tiananmen Square. A Tiananmen Square massacre, I mean. And uh, over the 24 years since Tiananmen Square, the CCP has established which I called two China structure. In China, actually, there are two separate societies. The separation has come to a degree which is unprecedented, which I have not seen in any country in my life. How that came into being? The Tiananmen massacre created a strong sense of fear and dismay of general pub publics. Uh, politics among their ordinary people in China. But it also created a sense of fear and a crisis within the communist regime because it had brought unprecedented public awareness to human rights and democracy. The regime had to face a totally different international domestic reality and resort to tactics to maintain the stability. The subsequent disintegration of the Soviet Union and the Eastern uh, European bloc cast an even heavier clot on the party officials of, at all levels. They all began to doubt how long our flag will fly, the red flag. But shortly after Deng Xiaoping's uh, famous Southern inspection tour in 1992, the communist officials at all levels realized the three realities, three realities. First, the Chinese Communist Party's stay in power has nothing whatsoever to do with the communist ideology. Second, economic growth means everything. That is, continued economic growth is the last best hope to keep CCP ship afloat. Third, in order to uphold the one-party dictatorship, the, it had to rely once again on capitalizing on the dark and evil side of human nature, spoiling the elite in exchange for their loyalty. Therefore, the corruption of a powerful elite now became accepted, endorsed, even demanded. Within the understanding of these three realities, the communist officials developed an undocumented, but almost unanimously accepted code of conduct, rather code of corruption. So every piece of government power is on sale in the market, and every corner of the market is invaded by political power. I keep the story short. In that way, the result is a China ink one of societies, I call it China Incorporated. The whole China, whole China Incorporated form, China Incorporated form by red capitalists, first of all. And second, through the marriage between power and capital. So in the, in the, in the, you know, before that, the sole holder, the stockholder of China Inc. are Communist Party officials. Now, during these years, in 1990s, they opened uh, a share of China Inc. to capitalists, domestic and international. And it involved a lot of American businessmen in China, doing business in China. And they take advantage of a low human rights standard. And a lot of capitalists love it. They don't have to worry about working contention. They don't have to worry about uh, collective uh, bargaining power from uh, uh, people and organize the protest against uh, you know, whatever they have there. And the low environmental protection and the low morality, low wages, and banning collective bargaining power. And China Inc. opened its share free 
two intellectuals. Those had been the conscience of the society. And because of the terror imposed after Tiananmen Square massacre and the piece of action from China Inc., many intellectuals, elite intellectuals, became cynical and become a part of China Inc. So in today, it's China. That's what we have. That's not free market. So that's power, political elite, capital, economic elite, and the intellect, social and cultural elite are bonded together with corruption and ad adhesive to form an alliance that maintains the existing political order. So this group tried very hard in past years to project the image to the whole world dazzling the whole world with the wealth, high rises buildings in Beijing, Shanghai, the power, glory, that you know, the outside observers believe they are the China. They represent China. But the truth is, there is another society consistent of everybody else. I call it in some of my talks, I call it China of citizens, not citizens. Actually, that based on a real story. Uh, because in the eyes of officials, the arrogant officials, the ordinary people, the powerless, are just a shit in front of them. <laughs> and that is circulated in China's website. So I come up with a term. So another China is a China of citizens. But you know, I don't want to repeat that because I want to <laughs> reserve my respect for my fellow citizens back in China. So I call it another China. So that's the two China structure. And how the communist regime keeps this structure. This is a free, not free market. So if you believe in free market, China has no such a thing. And how the uh, Chinese regime keep this uh, structure. Uh, oh, let, let, let me, uh, first before that, to tell you a little bit how these two China diverge. How China, two, two China diverge. Number one, China Inc. possesses all the political, economic, and the social and cultural resources in China. You know, you know revolved with the, with the government. And number two, the rules of the game at all levels in China are set by China Inc., who also officiates the games. In just two decades, two decades China achieved a polar polarization of the country with unprecedented speed. We all talk about gap between the wealth and the poor. Tend to thinking, tend to think that is the result of market. No. That is not a result of market. It is a result of politics in China. And I just give you a number. 0.4% of China's household possess 70% of national wealth. That's how two societies diverge. And uh, number three, citizens. I use it again. By no means citizens. As we are not able to enjoy basic benefit or constitutional warranty the civil rights. I don't have to say that. Everybody, I think, you know, the cases are documented uh, in many rights groups. And number four, the elite's monopoly over power, capital information, and, and its insularity makes the mobility, mobility between the two, sides, uh, two societies uh, nearly stagnant. So it's almost for almost impossible for <coughs> people to become a member of an elite now in China, even more difficult than Mao Zedong's era. Number five, the two China no longer speak a common political language. When you go to China, you run into different political languages, public languages. The so official language is still, you know, uh, very low, uh, far from the reality. Uh, on every day is a TV show. and you get online, you will learn another language. So there is no common language, uh, public language in China with which people can debate on public issues. And number six, 
the two Chinas have almost no common political life, no common political life between the two societies. And number seven, the emotional division. So the distrust of one group and with another, there's a tremendous tr uh, trust deficit. And there's two hatred, the hatred against the officials, hatred against wealthy, as you, ubiquitous in China. So that's a whole two society diverse. And another question, how the Chinese regime keeps the two China structure? And I, I just try to be short, okay. On top of the traditional lies and violence, which every dictator will use, uses, every dictator, uh, uh, violence and lies. On top of that, China in the past two decades developed, uh, I call it a dragon shift strategy. Two body, I mean the body, dragon, the one body. Sustaining economic growth at all costs to maintain the regime's ruling legitimacy. Two wings. I have not seen any dragon. I don't know how many wins, but I just say dragon shit. Okay. Two wins. Appeasing the elite with corruption. And another wing is suppressing the powerless with rock police. China is a 100% police state now. Two class. Purging democracy activists activists, advocates like Liu Xiaobo, the Nobel Peace Prize, jailed, the only jailed Nobel laureate in the world. And another claw, blocking public opinion, the information flow. So that's the strategy they use to keep a two-China structure. And I think I'm running out of uh, time. Mm -hmm. I just uh, give you uh, a brief uh, description of China's reality. So communist legacy is an everyday reality in China. China has no free market. If you believe in free market and believe free market will bring democracy, I tell you the truth. There is no such a thing in China. We have to uh, think of other strategies to help change China. <clears throat> well, we have been given much to think about from our <laughs> panelists today. Uh, and it seems to me that, in a sense, that a, a common answer in, in all of these cases is that the truth and nothing but the truth must be told about communism. That's what we're committed to. We thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. No time for questions. Yeah, question. yes, yes, yes. Do, we, do we have any questions? Time for questions. Dr. Edwards. Dr. Edwards. Any questions? Any? No? <laughs>